this is courtesy of another magazine this is um the another magazine decided to uh dig through their contact list and decide to get the real scoop on holston and if you're not familiar holston is a very well-known or legendary let's say um sort of like cult favorite designer from the u.s that who died unfortunately i think if i'm not mistaken in the late 90s one of the kind of you know breakout sort of like um fashion labels and names you know in the uh, late 80s late 80s early 90s and now there's a documentary and a movie out about no documentary and a tv series out about him on netflix now at the moment i recommend you check it out um it's really cool it's called holston it starts i think ewan mcgregor plays holston in it it's a fairly um decent kind of depiction of him as a person i think overall maybe not as a designer uh maybe kind of has you know maybe kind of gives a good overview of his story there's obviously some holes in it some inaccuracies here and there but in terms of kind of the perils and the kind of successes and the failures of what it means to be a kind of you know a rock star fashion designer it definitely tells a fairly good and um course a fairly good and sort of um good story in terms of giving young people out there an idea so what you should kind of look for and look out for when you're kind of ascending your way up to trajectory right because it feels like the wholesome story isn't really unique it feels like it's happened to a number of people right this idea of like the you know the great ascent and then the great descent and then kind of suddenly the people that were all around you kind of you know riding on your cocktails are nowhere to be found in your darkest moments um so it's definitely a really cool depiction in that regard i think the over drug use that eventually led to his overall downfall for and then you know the reckless abandonment when it comes to you know the sexual desires on that malarkey especially during the the aids epidemic as well wasn't necessarily the greatest of things to see but again a very sobering and good reminder to people out there in terms of you know just keeping um, your eye on the prize and trying to um have some sort of moderation in the things that you do but i thought that was a fairly accurate depiction i think overall i think for the most part in my brief experience working with fashion and having people that have worked in there for the most part especially in even entertainment is a good example whenever you ever ask yourself oh where's such and such or what happened to he or she usually they always say there's always two um reasons or excuses or two rationales as to what's happened to them and why you haven't heard of them recently and it's either a they decided to take a break and leave the industry whether it's due to their poor sales or inability to kind of break through or number two is always drugs and alcohol there's never any there's never a third option it's not because you know they're really trying hard and they just haven't popped through no if you're really trying really hard and you haven't popped through someone's still going to be talking about you you're still going to see their person's name mentioned somewhere you might see them on your feed still if you follow them but if the person is a decided to kind of call it quits and you know not keep going because they've been knocked back too often you're not going to see them on your feet too often and if the person decided to indulge in drugs and alcohol the last thing they're going to want to do is kind of put themselves in front and center on social media because it's going to be fairly obvious that they've kind of succumbed to drugs and alcohol so unfortunately again in that industry in that scene you know being that kind of wild person and indulging in those sort of things is great it's not rewarded but it's kind of encouraged not rewarded but it's just a byproduct of the industry that you're in maybe it's the long hours maybe it's the you know it's the un it's the kind of um unrealistic workloads that get placed on people you think of what you know you look at what carl lagerfeld was doing before he passed away right he was designing what was it was it seven plus collections per year that he was putting together across all the brands that he was designing for like just insane level of output that he was required to do plus on top of all that all the resort collections that he was doing his namesake brand like just insane levels of output that they're kind of putting on some of these designers coming through especially some of the younger ones it's just an incredible amount of work and pressure that's been put on them especially monetarily especially when you think of some of the big conglomerates that come after you and buy you out and absorb you into their big houses and stuff right and then of course the pressure to keep up and impress the critics and keep the fashion kids on you and you know the fickle nature of the customers and the fans one moment you're everyone's favorite designer next moment everyone kind of hates you again it's just a complete horrendous roller coaster that may be the only way to really deal with it because maybe that's kind of why people are so shocked when people are able to kind of keep some level of sanity is to maybe indulge in the drugs and alcohol which might probably explain why some people were so forgiving when john galliano had his crazy anti-semitic you know outburst because a lot of people are like yeah i'm not surprised you said that but or did those things because it's legitimately impossible to be a functioning 
normal, well balanced sort of person working in this industry. You're gonna to have to snap because it's just it's gonna bring that out of you and draw that out of you. It might make more sense that way. But I thought it was a fairly good um you know cautionary tale in that regard. So I definitely recommend it for people going forward. But again, you know, some of his friends, some of his colleagues were very disappointed in the depiction of Holston and they basically were able to kind of speak about speak about it to another magazine and basically this article is the following the truth about Holston according to the people who knew him the new Netflix show has been derided as an inaccurate fictionalized account here the legendary designers friends colleagues and associates set the record straight providing an in providing an insight into the character of a man who was larger than life so we scroll down and say here Christopher Michael said I met Holston through Andy Warhol. My first impression was that he was such a sweet guy, but a very different guy from the way I perceived Andy. I don't mean to say Holston wasn't inclusive, but the world of fashion was more erudite and effet by nature. To create magic and illusion, you have to be arrogant and have attitude. It's just the way it is. It's a different mindset. In the era that I knew Holston was an Upper East Side and I was living in the West Village. So it was a very different mindset. That said, once I got to know him, I, I, I could see behind the curtain. People are much more real and it's easier to, to deal with and that's definitely something that probably still happens now i don't think it's necessarily a thing that's disappeared i think if anything um it is probably in fashion mostly it's definitely more rewarded the more sort of like up your own ass you are obviously it's a nice surprise when people are just decent people but for the most part the more kind of arrogant and really forthright you are with your opinions and your positions and how you view fashion usually the more people want to suck you off i think of a good example is hedy Samain, right he's kind of the rudest and the most kind of obtuse and the most standoffish when it comes to kind of you know critics and maybe fans are like really he doesn't really engage with anybody whatsoever he kind of lives in his own universe and people just can't get enough of him right um phoebe philo is another good example somebody that's kind of you know um refused to communicate in any way shape or form with her fans uh, with critics in any way shape or form during this hiatus or whatever you know during her time even when she was designing a celine so i think those sort of like that creation of a person and personality is sort of because i think there's a part in it in wholesome where one of his first lovers or whatever kind of gets annoyed at him because he starts to change how he speaks right he kind of purposely puts on this kind of weird um, affect in his voice and kind of does this weird theatrics and how he kind of stands and poses or whatever it may be. And you can see before his eyes that his friend was slowly but surely changing. And I think that maybe was just a realization in Holston alone that in order to survive, or in order to kind of reinvent himself as this newer guy, because obviously he, from, in, from this TV series, they made it seem as if like he started off being a, um, a maker of hats. What's the word called? I forgot what the word's called, but he started to pick. He be, uh, is it Miller, Millery, whatever it's called. He's, he be, first became a maker of hats and then progressed into doing ready wear, right? Or you know whatever it may be called in terms of like you know runway fashion. So he kind of felt with if he had to reinvent himself that way, he just had to turn into this other guy, this kind of you know personify the um, persona of. Um, Holston through and through. The continues here it says, "I didn't mean to preface it like Holston was untouchable. Um, everybody." whether it's an actor or actress we have to create who we are see and especially someone like a roy fonrick coming from the midwest that doesn't sell fashion same as Ro um, ralph litfitz or ralph lauren at the same time everyone had to reinvent themselves in the ryan murphy series they said that holston bought the house in montauk he didn't buy that house it was warhol's house that holston rented for a time i have a picture of holston lounging at warhol's place and he was just like one of the guys he was just trying to enjoy himself and game through his life the time that i saw him when he wasn't being wholesome the dress designer he was just being royal on the beach but no one ever called him royal that i know holson has all the person he needed to be when he needed to be when uh but when he was with his friends he didn't put on airs he did put on airs he maybe played into it a little bit but he wasn't that person all the time same as andy when he was around close friends it's hard to keep that going all the time and that's something you definitely see from the all biographies i've read or from the books i've read of people who were close to andy warhol he had the same sort of thing he was very different depending on who he was with in terms of groups and obviously a lot of people kind of felt as if like the more uppity and the more kind of uh, the more higher he got in terms of social standing the worse of a person he eventually ended up becoming to the point where towards the end of his life a lot of his closest friends sort of like recalled away from him because they felt as if like he was kind of you know enjoying the smell of his own farts but i don't know man i just think it must be such a 
there is something so intangible something so ephemeral something so like hard to grasp about becoming such an icon at that level it's fairly impossible to remain humble and quite you know quote unquote normal right as you were before it's just difficult to do so that's why people maybe it's a bad example it's why maybe some people get so you know are so shocked as to why someone like N'Golo Kante right the um you know box to box midfielder of Chelsea and you know the recent winner of the Champions League and why he's such a kind of like cool and humble dude that you know drives I think it's like a, a mini to you know he's a pressure footballer he earns millions and he drives a mini Cooper right a lot of people are really astounded by how humble he is and all that malarkey and maybe it's because everyone kind of knows deep down that if they were put in the same position and they were given the same level of access and wealth and position and status and all that malarkey, they will be acting out as well. And I think, just imagine what it must be like in the arts, right? It makes me recoil and it makes me vomit my own mouth whenever I go to like a art exhibition, right? Whenever I go to like a whatever, right? And I go and see people, go and see, a, I'll go to like a private view and there's obviously people there with high social standing and they're all trying to kind of jockey for position and try and get into the right circles to talk and, you know, exchanging kind of empty platitudes and giggling at jokes that aren't really funny. It makes me vomit. But then imagine if you're the person that's on the end of that and you're receiving all that love and all that adoration from people for artwork you created, you know, in the space of a couple of hours, stuff that you just thought about when you were drunk one night or whatever it may be, right? Stuff that's kind of coming to you just without you trying, right? Um, stuff that you've kind of finally sort of tapped into who you are and you kind of finally now be able to kind of relay it and put it out on a canvas or in a, you know, in a piece of performance art or in the sculpture. Just imagine what that must feel like to have people you know adults people that are way older than you people that are richer than you whatever maybe better position but long way more experienced than you you know bowing at your feet kissing your toes you know giving you all the praise it's definitely going to do something to your mental it's definitely going to make you think maybe higher of you of yourself than probably you should be but maybe that kind of helps with your creative output too there might need there needs to be maybe um being a high level creative in any field that may be it's sort of similar to kind of like the delusion that you need to have if you're like a professional fighter if you're like a you know mixed 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 martial artist or if you're like a boxer or something you kind of need to believe you know you kind of need to have a sense of delusion that you can go into that ring octagon wherever you are and beat whoever comes through those ropes or through that gate you have to because if not you can't effectively fight really can you because if you're doubting your skill set if you're doubting your position and your ability to win then you've already lost before you even started. So you have to kind of have that level of delusion. So maybe the same thing happens with art and entertainment, right? You kind of have to believe you're the best. You kind of have to believe that all this gratitude and all this love you're getting is, is kind of warranted and, you know, deserved. Like, yeah, it's about time you guys start sucking me off. I'm the shit, right? Because if not, how are you going to be able to put together seven designs per year plus and footwear and accessories and all that stuff? Like, how are you going to be able to do it? It's impossible. You kind of have to have that kind of level of delusion. Maybe, maybe. It's a picture of Hugh McGregor in the back of a limo. Let's read one more here. Peter Wise is an American artist and author of Surf and director of the Christopher Macca Studio. He says here, I was working at an orchid shop next door to Holston on 68th Street. He called me on Monday and asked if I wanted to do something for him. I said, sure. He said, I'm hosting a, char a James Charles, oh, James Charles, a Charles James benefit. Okay, funny to hear that name there. At the Brooklyn Museum. So I need flowers and a reception and then the, f and then f flowers for 50 tables at one dinner it was a baptism by fire and i passed a test from then on i started working with him as an independent contractor back then the only place you could go to get good orchids were at the greenhouses in long island california or florida it was a very limited supply and Holson liked it best the common perception of Holson was that he was very egocentric which was which was but at the same time he was very generous see everyone's saying the same thing he definitely had a bit of an ego on him and um, he was a big patron of the martha graham he did costumes for adults companies um he dressed for free um, i met her once while delivering orchids from holston i went up to her apartment and she was lying on a couch in her black glamour mink coat and nothing else i told that holston and he said oh she's being very coy wasn't she she was being very seductive in her 90 year old way a day or two after thanksgiving 1982 i was at the olympic towers putting to flowering orchids around and holston showed up out of nowhere with a couple of nephews and nieces in tow he showed them the view of the central park and said that's the 
children's zoo where they keep all the children he lost the children were dismissed then Hosan looked at what I was doing and said that looks really good but we can make it better for the next hour and a half he and I slipped and orchards around it was very hands-on typically Hosan he was very collaborative he respected other people and liked to work with them it was very intimate and I was lucky to have that experience with him so yeah this is an article from another magazine i recommend you check it out it's called here yeah, was the title the truth about holston according to people who knew him definitely check it out and of course check out the holston series now available on netflix it's a very illuminating view on the legend that is holston <laughs>